Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Mark Jensen? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Mark Jensen was born on October 5, 1959. He was raised in Wisconsin. Mark met a woman named Julie Jensen in 1981. They both went to college, but only Mark graduated. The couple married on April 14, 1984. They lived in the town of Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. Mark took a job in the finance industry, following the footsteps of his father. Julie was a stay-at-home mom, and she volunteered at a school. Mark and Julie had a son named David in 1990. After this, Julie started working part-time at a financial services company. Julie struggled with postpartum depression, and she was displeased with her husband's behavior. She felt as though Mark was more interested in alcohol and hanging out with his friends as opposed to spending time with her. She also believed that Mark was unhappy about all the attention she was giving to their son David like Mark was jealous that he was no longer number one. During a weekend when Mark was out of town for work, Julie invited one of her co-workers to her house. The man ended up spending the weekend with her. Mark later found out about the affair, and Julie filed for a divorce. Mark told Julie that if they divorced, she would never see their son David again. Julie did not want to take this chance and agreed to participate in marriage counseling. The couple decided to stay together, after all. They would have another son four years later. His name was Douglas. Not long after the situation with the affair and the decision to stay together, someone started leaving photographs in various places outside of the Jensen family home. The photographs were for adults only. They contained close-ups of various body parts. Julie did not believe the body parts in the photographs were hers, but she thought whoever took the photographs was trying to make it appear this way. This individual was trying to embarrass her. In addition to the unwanted images, Julie started receiving harassing phone calls. Mark said that he believed that Julie's lover was responsible. Julie went to the police, and they investigated the lover. They discovered that he no longer lived in the area, and he was ruled out as a potential suspect. To get to the bottom of the harassment, Julie hired a private investigator who eventually came to suspect Mark. The PI perceived Mark as the plausible perpetrator of the photo placement and proclaimed this to Julie. However, Julie resisted the possibility of Mark's potential participation. The photograph deliveries continued for six years. In 1998, Mark started having an affair with a co-worker of his named Kelly Labonte. Kelly was engaged when the affair started and eventually married, at work, Mark and Kelly did not hide their affair very well. It was painfully obvious what they were doing. In October 1998, Kelly told Mark that she had set a deadline for the end of the year to decide what they were going to do with this relationship. Both of them would have to leave their respective spouses if they wanted to be together. Not long after this, on November 21, 1998, Julie wrote a letter addressed to the police department in Pleasant Prairie. Here's a summary of that letter. Julie took a photograph of a list that she found in her husband's daily planner, which left her concerned about her safety. The list contained items like razor blades and syringes. Julie believed that her husband may be interested in killing her. She wanted the police to know that she would never harm herself. If anything happened to her, Mark should be the first suspect. Julie noted that Mark had never forgiven her for having the affair back in 1991. She wrote that she took Tylenol, daily vitamins, and a few other medications, as if she was trying to establish what should and should not be in her system at autopsy. Julie ended the note by hoping that she was incorrect, but she was still fearful about an early demise. Julie sealed the letter in an envelope and gave it to her neighbor, telling him to go to the police if anything happened to her. Which brings me to the timeline of the crime. On December 1, 1998, Julie had an appointment with her family physician. She had been experiencing symptoms of depression. Julie weighed only 115 pounds, 
having lost eight pounds over the last few months. The physician recommended that Julie see a mental health counselor. In addition, the physician gave Julie the antidepressant, Paxil. On December 2, Julie was supposed to volunteer at David's school, but she did not show up. Eight-year-old David told his teacher that his mother was not feeling well. Mark went to see the family physician about Julie's mood. The physician gave Mark the sedative Ambien, which Mark was supposed to give to his wife. On the morning of December 3, Julie was having trouble breathing. Her son David described his mother's breathing as raspy. He asked Mark if his mother should be taken to the hospital. Mark responded by saying if Julie wasn't feeling well later, he would take her to the hospital. Mark did not go to work that day. He was seen driving around the area. He picked up his two sons in the afternoon and took them home. Mark told them to wait as he checked on their mother. Not long after this, Mark said that Julie was dead. Mark called the authorities and the police started investigating. They felt as though the scene at the house was suspicious. Julie's body was face down on her bed. Her left arm was underneath her body and visible on her right side. It was an unusual position. Mark's behavior seemed to be inappropriate for someone who just lost his wife. For example, a neighbor described him as emotionless. At Julie's wake, he was seen laughing and joking. He appeared to be eager to dispose of Julie's belongings. He gave away her jewelry and put her clothes out for trash. And Mark's lover, Kelly, moved in not long after Julie's death. The police watched Mark for a while. They were hoping he would make some type of mistake, which would indicate his guilt. They finally interviewed him in April of 1999. He denied that Kelly was his lover, which the police knew was untrue. They had searched Mark's computer and found emails suggestive of a romantic relationship. An autopsy revealed a small amount of ethylene glycol in Julie's system. This is a poisonous chemical used in antifreeze. The medical examiners had different opinions about the cause of death. One said Julie was poisoned. Another said that asphyxiation was the cause of death. Either of those causes was bad news for Mark. In 2002, Mark was arrested and charged with first-degree intentional homicide. While he was out on bail, he married Kelly. This couple was not going to let Mark's heinous homicide hypothesis hinder the harmonious happiness of their holy matrimony. In February 2008, Mark was tried and convicted for Julie's murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Mark and Kelly divorced in 2009. It's not clear who wanted the divorce. If it was Mark, maybe he felt as though marriage was a life sentence and he was all stocked up. In December 2013, Mark's conviction was overturned because the letter from Julie never should have been introduced at trial. Mark had the right to confront any witness testifying against him, and there was no way to do that because Julie was dead. In September 2017, Mark's conviction was reinstated, but in February of 2020, this decision was reversed. Mark's second trial started in January 2023. The letter written by Julie was not presented as evidence, although this did not help Mark enough to win his freedom. On February 1, Mark was found guilty of first-degree intentional homicide. He is scheduled to be sentenced in April, but the mandatory penalty is life in prison, so there's not much of a mystery about what's going to happen. Now moving to my analysis. Mark Jensen maintains his innocence, and some people are on his side. Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that Mark is guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. Mark was angry about a brief affair that his wife had in 1991. He was probably responsible for harassing his wife with those photographs and phone calls. Mark had a conversation with a co-worker about poison, including ethylene glycol, and about how he didn't like his wife. Mark conducted searches on the internet for information related to poison and the symptoms of poisoning. He deleted the searches, but they were still recovered. People thought that Mark was controlling and demanding. Mark was having an affair before his wife died, and his lover implied that there was a deadline for a decision about the relationship. Maybe Mark felt like he was under pressure. Mark disposed of Julie's belongings right after she died, and his lover moved into his house. Julie had told a few people that she was afraid of Mark, and she wrote the letter, even though the letter was not admissible 
during the second trial. Julie's body was in an unusual position when she died, and her system contained small amounts of ethylene glycol. Moving to the exculpatory factors, Julie had been treated for depression on a few occasions and was depressed right before she died. Julie had an affair in 1991, therefore she was certainly capable of hurting Mark. Maybe she framed him for her own death. She orchestrated this to make him pay. No physical evidence ties Mark to his wife's death. When considering the evidence in this case, do I think that Mark Jensen is guilty? Yes, I think he's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, regardless of whether the letter is admissible or not. The pattern of behavior demonstrated by Mark indicates that he was selfish, manipulative, vindictive, and had no empathy. Moving to the last question, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Mark Jensen had a few characteristics from vulnerable narcissism, including being insecure and vindictive. When Julie had the affair in 1991, this represented an insult that Mark could never forgive. It was a narcissistic injury from which his ego could not recover. He thought about the insult every moment. Everything reminded him of how he was a victim. It lingered in the air around him. Every breath he took, he detected the stench of disrespect. He believed the world was laughing at him for being weak and vulnerable. Only revenge would make things right. He thought to himself, how dare Julie do this to me? Doesn't she know who I am and what I am capable of? Mark planned to get revenge. His best way to achieve this goal was if Julie stayed married to him, but she had filed for divorce. He went to marriage counseling with Julie so they could reconcile. He manipulated her into staying. Soon after they decided to stay together, Mark started harassing his wife by acting as though her former lover was trying to embarrass her. Mark emphasized the sexual component of the relationship by sending the photographs. Mark wanted Julie to suffer humiliation, to regret ever having disparaged him, and to constantly be in a state of sorrow and grief. Mark punished her for six years and probably only stopped because he became bored. When Mark found a new lover, he was not going to give Julie the satisfaction of divorcing him. That would mean sharing custody and dividing assets. Mark was never going to tolerate that. He planned his final act of revenge, homicide. Mark poisoned his wife with antifreeze and gave her excessive quantities of other drugs. In Mark's opinion, the antifreeze was taking too long to kill Julie. On December 3, 1998, Mark had promised his children he would take Julie to the hospital that evening if her condition had not improved. When he arrived home with the children in the afternoon, Mark went to check on his wife and discovered that she was still alive. He suffocated her and then announced to his children that their mother was dead. Like many people with narcissistic characteristics, Mark was obvious with his intent, but he believed he was deceiving everyone. He did not have the empathy to understand how other people perceived him. Many people knew that Mark was dangerous. Julie even wrote a letter, which indicated as much. Now moving to my final thoughts. The vindictiveness of a narcissist is one of their most destructive traits. Julie harbored a premonition that Mark had lethal intent. His threats to take her son coerced her into remaining in his crosshairs. Mark just kept taking shot after shot hurting Julie as often as he could. Julie was an easy target, but Mark needed her to suffer even more. Even after he murdered her, Mark may have felt as though Julie was able to escape with a light penalty. No matter how much pain she experienced, Mark Jensen would never be satisfied. Those are my thoughts in the case of Mark Jensen. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.